by a German U-boat during World War I. We have with us tonight local historians who will discuss the attack and its impact on the town and will reveal some recent research that sheds considerable light on why Orleans was a target of the German sub. Our distinguished panel of historians tonight are Bonnie Snow of the Orleans Historical Society, Ron Peterson and Michael Hicks of the Orleans Historical Commission, and Duane Chase of the French Cable Station Museum. Tonight you will learn about the following, an overview of the attack, the background on the U-156 submarine and German strategy, the Coast Guard and rescue, the Navy and the counterattack, the militia and shades of 1814, and finally, what Orleans was like in 1918. Tonight's symposium will feature a recording of the voice of Reuben Hopkins as he recalled the attack in a 1968 lecture. Mr. Hopkins was part of the Coast Guard crew that manned Orleans Station 40, and he observed the attack from the lookout tower at the station. This is truly firsthand oral history at its best, and a real treat, which I know you will all enjoy. Please join me in welcoming our speakers for tonight. Thank you, Tavi, and thank you for all your help in the, over the last few days and for uh, affording us the use of this great facility. We really appreciate it. Um, the United States is, is currently in the process of wrapping up its 100th commemoration of World War I. Um, as you all know, uh, the armistice that, that ended the, uh, the war to end all wars, as we called it um, back then, didn't work out that way, um, was uh, in November of 1918, the 11th hour of the, the 11th day of the 11th month. So the, this attack on Orleans took place um, in the waning days of the war. And, and I guess the way we could look at it here is that uh, we didn't want to end the war until Orleans got to play its part in it. Uh, <laughs> Not really, but you'll, you'll, you'll learn a little bit about the, the, the strategy. And I just um, point out our, um, our panelists here. This is Michael Hicks, who's my colleague on the uh, Historical Commission. And Michael um, is the designer of the logo that you see. Uh, this is a, that logo is a pure Orleans original, which, uh, which Michael designed. Uh, and we're very grateful for it. Uh, Dwayne Chase is, is on the board of directors of the French Cable Museum, who you'll hear tonight, the French Cable Station played more of a role in this attack than, than we, we thought. Um, there's been some recent research that I think you'll find very interesting. And most importantly is, is Bonnie Snow. Um, and uh, I can't say enough about Bonnie. Um, uh, I think one of the reasons that we do things like this in Orleans is because of the inspiration that Bonnie has uh, lent to this town for, for many years and continues to do so. And uh, when I first came to Orleans uh, seven years ago and, and decided I, I wanted to immerse myself in the history of, of uh, the town, I learned quickly that you don't just follow in Bonnie's footsteps, you stand on her shoulders because she's built a, she's built a foundation um, for preserving our history and heritage and continues to do so that, that we all need to be very grateful for. So thank you, Bonnie, for all that you do. And, and I also want to point out another key person to this commemoration, and that's um, Pat Perry sitting in the back. Um, Pat is uh, an associate of the Historical Commission, uh, has done a lot of work on the markers, and has been instrumental in um, uh, moving us along. She, she, uh, she's the one that keeps us on track, uh, keeps us moving in the right direction, and she's the one that gets things done. And the, flag that you see, I don't know if everybody can see it, um, it's, it's hanging up on the front, but uh, there'll be flags flying around the town uh, 
this coming season, and, and Pat's the one that m made that happen. So thank you very much, and a shout out to Pat Perry. Oh, there it is. I'm yeah. sorry, right in front of me. Right hand. Right, <laughs> right hand. hand. I'm a real tech guy. You'll, you'll come to <laughs> learn that. Um, the attack on our liens that we're going to be discussing tonight uh, lasted for only about an hour. Um, but it produced hours and hours and hours of material. And as we sifted through this, we realized that we couldn't cover everything in, in a session like this. Um, so we're, our goals tonight are number one, to give you an overview of the attack, um, to uh, reveal and, and talk about some, some recent research that's been done that casts some light on exactly why, why Orleans was picked. Um, was it a random, isolated kind of a thing or was there a lot more to it than that? So we, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, and, and to convey the fact that, that, that it wasn't any, uh, an isolated random attack, uh, but it was a part of a strategy on the part of the German government to um, uh, pull the war out at the end. They were, uh, Germany was starving much more so than we knew at the time, and things weren't going all that well on the battlefield, and they came up with this, this uh, last minute strategy uh, involving the submarines to, uh, uh, to try to pull it out. Um, and finally, uh, uh, we, we hope to uh, stimulate your interest in attending some of the, uh, the other events that we'll be having between now and, and the end of July. Um, I'll just uh, highlight a few of them. The July 19th, um, uh, 7 p.m., um, lecture is Jake Clem. Jake is the author of the book Attack, in or Attack on Our Leans, which you may have um, seen, maybe some, anybody read this or, or have it? Some of you have, okay. Uh, Jake will be here, uh, this was published in 1914, and it's, it's a really comprehensive, in-depth and well-done summary of, of, of what was happening. And on the following night, on the 20th, uh, we have Paul Hados, who is the author of the Kaiser's Lost Cruiser. Uh, cruiser. Um, this is essentially a biography of the U-boat uh, that attacked us. Um, Paul Hados is a, um, an intelligence analyst for the government by trade, uh, and he wrote this book um, with access to a lot of primary documents, transcripts of um, uh, radio messages and and some real first-hand stuff, and, and he has answered a lot of questions that have been um, floating around in the first hundred years after the attack. So we, I'd encourage you to attend all of these if you, if you can, uh, but those are two highlights. Bonnie's walks this summer will be geared around the attack to the, to the greatest degree possible, and, and both the Historical Society and the um, uh, French Cable Museum will be uh, open with, with uh, appropriate displays. Uh, one of the things that really makes this um, uh, wandering away here, uh, can everybody hear me okay? Uh, no, no, no. no, okay, is that better? Okay, I, I need to stay closer here. I, um, one of the things that makes this uh, event really special and really incredible is that the attack in 1918 wasn't the first, but the second time that this tiny town of, of at the time was just over a thousand people in both cases, was attacked by a foreign power during a, one of our nation's wars. Uh, it's, it's really hard to uh, envision that, but, but it happened, and that's part of our heritage. Uh, in uh, 1814, on December 19th, we were attacked by a landing party of uh, British Marines and, and uh, seamen uh, intent on destroying some of our shipping and our, and our salt works. Uh, they were quickly repelled by the um, Orleans militia. And that's where our slogan, defiant and self-reliant, um, comes from. Um, 
Defiance Lane down in Rock Harbor is, is uh, said to have come from, from that. Um, and, and that's where the, well, the, the, it's gone, but the, uh, the slogan on, on our logo comes from. We, we decided to carry that forward because um, a lot of what Orlean showed on July 21st, 1918, showed that exact same kind of um, uh, defiance and self-reliance that we saw in 1814. Um, just as an example, uh, um, uh, Dr. Danforth Taylor, uh, uh, who lived on Nosset Heights and who uh, observed the attack from his home, he got on the phone right away and he, he was giving a blow-by-blow -blow description to the Boston Globe. And one of the things he reported is that as the attack was occurring during that hour when the the uh, shells were flying that the people who lived along the bluffs and, and in, within sight of the attack started bringing out American flags and hanging them from their porches and from their decks. Uh, just incredible. People didn't run away from the sound of the guns, they ran toward the sounds of the guns. And then there's the legend of Agnes Hopkins who was playing the organ at the Federated Church um, and when, when somebody came in and announced that there was a, an attack occurring at Nossa Beach, everybody ran out of the church except Agnes, who kept playing the organ <laughs> for, the, for the entire time that the service would have taken. I mean, those, those I, I don't know, I, I, I'm, I'm uh, prejudiced, I know, but those kinds of things don't happen in, in a lot of other places. That's, a, that's just a quick shot of a, uh, the, Boston, um, uh, the Boston Post on the, on the day after the attack. This really was a big deal. Um, one thing of note I noticed is there's the headline about the attack, but this is interesting too. You know, this, this kind of tells you things weren't going so well for the Germans at the time. They, um, the Allies were, were advancing on the battlefield. Uh, so, Sunday morning, um, July 21st, 1918, it was a, uh, a hot uh, day, it was sunny, uh, it, it looked to be a, a good day in Orleans, a fog was lifting. Um, uh, off of, uh, off of the, the shore. Um, people were at the beach, they were sitting on their porches, they were uh, on their way down to the train depot waiting for the Sunday papers to be delivered, um, going about their business. Um, and those that looked off the shore noticed a, a tugboat, uh, the Perth Amboy with four barges in tow, heading from north to south, not an uncommon sight. Um, the Cape Cod Canal was open, but because they charged the toll, a lot of shipping uh, avoided the canal and still took the chance of, of going around the Cape. Um, uh, but then, you know, everything was, was, was going along nicely, but then this, this uh, apparition appeared uh, off the coast. And um, about 10.30, um, uh, it started started firing uh, at the at the convoy. Um, Michael is going to tell you a lot more about this this sub in a few minutes. But um, suffice it to say, at this point, we we have to look at this with a little bit of context. Um, and and a historian always tries to view events the way that people viewed them at the time. And we look at this today, and, and yeah, it, it's, it's a fearful weapon, but we might shrug our shoulders a little bit, but that's because we're conditioned by reports of thermonuclear war and ICBMs and chemical warfare and biological warfare and EMPs. Um, but believe me, in, in, those, in those days, that was an extremely fearful weapon uh, appearing off, off of our coast. And those two deck guns that you see were had some awesome firepower. Um, that's the captain of the, uh, uh, of the U-156, uh, Richard Felt. Um, it was his uh, first command of, uh, of a U-boat. Um, 
And it was the U-156's second mission. It had been on a previous mission uh, off the coast of Portugal and actually shelled a town in Portugal, um, killing uh, civilians, destroying a church. And, and ironically, it was trying to destroy a cable station, and it failed that time as well. Um, this is uh, just a, a schematic of the, uh, of the attack. Um, you'll see the red, can y'all see in the back, there's, there's the red dots are the um, shells that landed on shore. Um, the, the attack lasted for about an hour, um, plus or minus, uh, uh, given to who you, you listen to. The sub fired about 150 rounds and uh, with a number of them landing on shore. And one of the questions that exists to this day is, were the shells that, that um, landed on shore deliberate? Were they deliberately fired on shore? And I think you can argue that both ways. Uh, there's some evidence that the guns were too big for the deck and they had a tremendous recoil problem, making accurate fire um, very difficult. But Shelling civilians was, was and, you know, putting fear into the hearts of civilians was at the heart of unrestricted submarine warfare, as, as Michael will, will um, uh, tell you. And you'll actually hear this shot right here. You're going to hear Reuben Hopkins talk about that in, in, in a few minutes. Uh, but the four barges were sunk, um, uh, and the Perth Amboy, the tug, was badly damaged. Um, uh, nobody was killed, uh, fortunately, but uh, among, the, um, um, the f among the four vessels, there were 32 civilians on board. Or, um, I'm sorry, there was a total of 30, 32 people on board the five vessels, and uh, there were five, uh, four women and five children. Uh, in those days, it was common for barge captains to take their families um, along with them. But one of history's really ironic footnotes is that the Perth Amboy, as I say, was badly damaged, but it was um, uh, repaired and it returned to service for and had a very long career after that. But incredibly, it, it put in an appearance in World War II as well. Uh, it was uh, one of the boats that participated in the evacuation of Dunkirk. Um, so if you saw the movie Dunkirk, I don't know if they portrayed the, uh, the, the, the uh, Perth Amboy, but it was there. And a few years later, it met its final end in a, in a collision. Um, just a, 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 some very quick context about the war. Um, you know, we want to we want to think a little bit about what were the people in Orleans thinking, and what were the people in the United States thinking um, when when the United when when World War One broke out in 1914, uh, there was a very strong pacifist notion not only among the, the people of the country but um, among our uh, uh, government as well. And President Wilson, uh, the common thinking was that this was Europe's problem. We had no business getting involved. We had no business helping them solve their problems. They needed to solve it themselves. And, um, uh, you know, and, and, and we, we just wanted to stay out of it. Uh, uh, President Wilson was a strong believer in diplomacy. Um, he viewed himself as a peacemaker and tried very hard to, uh, to act as a, as a broker among the warring parties. As it turned out, much to the irritation of the British and the French, but, but th th that's what he did. Um, and we also, there was this really strong belief in this country that the vast Atlantic Ocean would protect us from um, anything that happened in Europe. We had this buffer that, that was impenetrable. Um, and in 1916, w Wilson was reelected handily uh, in the election, and he ran on a slogan of, he kept us out of war. So that, that's how strongly uh, people felt. A um, Couple of things intervened that, that made the, our pacifist uh, position at the time change. 
Um, the first was the Lusitania, which was the British liner, was sunk in, in 1915. Um, um, large loss of life, some of them Americans. Um, that wasn't a game changer, but it was started to, to have people wake up that, the, gee, this submarine might be something that, that could, uh, could hurt us someday. Um, then were the declaration of unrestricted war, uh, submarine warfare by the Kaiser. Um, he, de he, he, he declared that it would take effect on February 1st, 1917, but he didn't announce it until January 31st. So there was, there was no warning. That was, the kind of, that was what we were dealing with at the time. Michael's going to uh, discuss that at length. But then uh, the Zimmerman telegram was the game changer. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. The British uh, intercepted a cable uh, from uh, Foreign Minister Arthur Zimmerman intended to be delivered to the president of Mexico, proposing an alliance with Mexico um, in the event that, that uh, the United States entered the war. Um, the, the, um, th that completely changed, and, and in return for ending the war, the Kaiser promised the um, uh, president of Mexico that uh, they would get back Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, and, and a couple of other of the southern states that the United States had taken in the War of 1846. Um, so the Zimmerman telegram was the game changer. Um, it was no longer, uh, entering the war was no longer just helping Europe solve their problems. Now it became defending the U.S., and, and opinion changed very quickly. Um, and we, we, we entered the war on April 6, 1917. And during that time, the submarine activity was, was increasing uh, along the East Coast uh, in ways that may surprise you. Um, but um, um, there were people in, in Orleans and all, around, all along the Cape were becoming jittery, and there were submarine sightings, so to speak. Some of them may have been real subs, some may have been whales. There was an incident in Provincetown where somebody hung a sheet out their window to, to dry, and they were, they were visited by uniformed military people um, and interrogated and told to take the sheet in. They were thinking that it might have been some kind of signal. Um, and and the, Boston, the Boston State House, the lights were dimmed in the dome at night for fear of attracting um, um, unwanted attention. But that's, that's just a brief um, overview of the attack and what was happening. I'm going to turn it over to Michael now uh, to discuss uh, why the sub was here and, and, and some interesting stuff about the sub. Good evening. So why was the German submarine here off of Cape Cod waters? in uh, late July of 1918. One thing I wanted to talk about is what the 156 was one of only six long-range cargo-capable submarines known as the U-Cruisers, which is what this is, book is all about. It was a special submarine, um, as I mentioned, there were only six of them, out of a fleet of 350 submarines in the German fleet at, during the, the, that war. Um, Germany, as Braun had said, Germany was suffering terribly from the Allied blockade, which basically essentially kept the German Navy in the Baltic Sea, and they couldn't get out, and they were not able to get um, goods which they needed to fight the war and to feed their own people. The German citizens were literally starving to death. So the design of this ship, which was um, commissioned by the Kaiser in late eight, uh, 1916, and they were built in 1917, uh, the purpose of it was to be a, an engine of war, but also a cargo ship that could go across the Atlantic to the United States, they hoped, and to bring cargo back to the German uh, country so that they could, they could fight the war. Um, and it, what's point, it's worth making the point that um, before America entered the war, there were at least two ships 
uh, German submarines, long range submarines, that actually made it to America. Uh, I don't remember what year, was it six, 1916? Uh, but they, they arrived in Baltimore, and to great acclaim, there was, it was like a party in, in town because the Germans had, uh, had, had arrived and they had gone all the way across the Atlantic. Of course, the purpose of that trip was to demonstrate to the American people that the Germans could do that, but I think they, they quickly forgot that. This was, so this was a, it was a very a long submarine that had the, the capacity, the fuel capacity, uh, to go all the way across the Atlantic and back without refueling. Um, it had, someone asked um, me the other day how many sailors were on the ship. There were seven officers, 50 sailors, and when they expected to capture ships, which is what was going to happen when they came to, the, to America, there was actually 22, a 20-person prize crew, which the purpose of their charge was just simply to take over the ships. And um, the armament of this ship was, they had um, to bow torpedo tubes, and they carried only 18 torpedoes. They only had room for that. They had these two 5.9-inch um, 5 deck guns, and they were able to carry 1,700 shells uh, with a standard cargo. And they also carried mines, so they had the capacity to lay mines which they did successfully. So the, one, the first reason that they, they came to American shores was to execute the unrestricted submarine warfare, which was a directive given to them directly by the Kaiser. And the purpose of, uh, and the, the purpose was to sink as much, all the shipping that they, they, act, uh, they encountered whether it was in a combatant nation or whether it was a neutral nation, and whether it was a military ship or whether it was a private ship, commercial ship. And the purpose of this, um, this edict was to uh, install, instill panic amongst the citizens, particularly Americans, uh, the, the Western, um, Western countries, because the, 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 they, they were desperate for the, the Navy that was, American Navy, which was contributing to the war effort in Europe, and blocking the, the Germans, to get those, those Navy ships back, at least a portion of them back to protect the American shores. In fact, six different submarines patrolled the west coast, uh, the east coast of America, um, the Western Atlantic, um, in 1918. 156 being only one of them. Of those, those six ships sunk a total of 102 ships, most of which were private or commercial ships, and many of which were sailing ships. So, it, you know, it, this was, it was a, a complete mismatch between the, the aggressor and the victim. But it's worth pointing out that in many cases, in fact, the, the, um, the commander of the 156 followed, despite their orders, the German captain chose to, uh, they, they used a tactic that allowed the crew of the victim ship to get away. They would come to the surface, they would shoot shells, um, so, um, and then they would make, make the victim ship stop. They would board the ship, they would inspect it. Very often they would take uh, souvenirs and then they would allow the crew to get onto their own, the, the victim ship's uh, lifeboats and get away before they sank the ship. Um, <clears throat> and as you'll hear later, um, many, many fishermen on the East Coast recognized that there was, the German subs were sinking mostly fishing vessels, but the average American um, citizen didn't understand that this, so the, the American uh, government and Canadian government officials were successful at restricting the news about these attacks, um, about these submarine attacks. The second reason was uh, communication cables. We'll talk about it later that the, uh, 
why the, the communication cable in Orleans was so important. But these submarines were fitted um, with a device that allowed them to, in theoretic, theoretically, to find the, the cable, to catch it, and to cut the cable. This, um, Paul Hardos's book talks extensively about this. Um, in fact, the um, Hardos was able to find a cable uh, from the 156 after they left Orleans waters, telling the, sh the uh, command in Germany that they had found the cable and had cut the cable in Orleans. But in fact, that proved not to be the case. The other point that's worth mentioning is right after 156 left us, they went to Portland, Maine, where there was another uh, communication cable. So it was clear that they were, they, they had a two-pronged purpose here. One was to sink ships, but also to find the cables and cut the cables. So this is a, a copy, there's, the original is over here, but this is a copy of um, the last two ships. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't want to go away from the, but, but um, the dotted line is the 155, 151, excuse me, which are entered American waters in late May of 2018, and they left uh, in late June. The dashed line is the 156, which attacked here. They started in late um, June, by mining, uh, putting mines in uh, New York Harbor, where they and they they were successful at sinking a, an American warship, the only warship that was uh, damaged by German submarines. And then they uh, then in um, late July, <clears throat> the first twenty first of July, they they were off the, our coast, and that's where where the attack of Orleans uh, occurred. If you come if you come up to look at this map, every one of these corners is a little red dot, and every one of those shows where an attack took place. So you can see what they did is they, they started in New York, they went to the Cape, they went up to Maine, and then they were basically ship, sinking ships off of, Newf of Newfoundland and Nova Scotia until they finally left uh, six weeks later. So this is a, a quick a summary of what was sunk by the 151, which was off of uh, New Jersey to Virginia. And you can see from the, um, from the flags, most of them were American, but a number of them were uh, Canadian, and some were Norwegian. They were all, those are all just commercial uh, um, cargo ships. And this is the 150, 156 which again started um, in New York and went, went, and then they spent most of their time uh, up in Canadian waters. And again, most of these, many of these were sailing ships, most of these were fishing ships, and again, only one of them was a military ship. <clears throat> this is a map of, of Orleans um, we created in for 1918, and again, the the yellow stars show where shells landed on line, and the arrow shows you where Station 40 was, um, where it was manned by um, Orleans men, and that's where, that's the station that was, um, a shell went over the top, and that's where the lifeboats went out to meet the victims who were being attacked, the Perth Amboy and, and the barges. So Bonnie, do you want to talk to, I have a series of slides here of, yes. that Bonnie gave me of, um, so this is again, this is Orleans in 1918.
photographer that came along on Main Street and Locust Grove, he lived on the corner there, and he came along a little bit later than H.K. Uh, Cummings. Uh, and, uh, oh, let's see, let's say 10 years ago, time goes by fast. Uh, I was at Thanksgiving dinner with my daughter and East Dam, and she invited an elderly neighbor, and uh, she, it was during drink time. And she said, do you like glass plates? I thought she was talking about dessert plates. <laughs> and I said, yes, and she said, well, I have some glass plates, and I'll have Julie bring them to you. And so the next day, there was a little tiny box without a cover, and there were over 113, 114 four-inch glass photography plates. And uh, she had lived in the house with the red shutters. If you are at the Catholic Church going to go on the bike trail or Locust Road, you go up that steep hill in Locust Road, and that little house is right there. And she found them in the attic. So he must have lived there at one point in time, Harry Sparrow. So we got the first CPA funding in this town of Orleans to develop all those slides. And uh, we, we had them ever since. And you wanted 40 of them blown up and framed. And when you go to town hall, you sometimes can see them and some of them are on display at the Historical Society. So these are Harry Sparrow plates, 1911. So it gives you an idea about what the town was like in 18. I don't think it changed too much. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, Main Street, and uh, this burnt in, uh, oh, I, I don't know, the 70s. And uh, they replaced it. And uh, it now, it's got the sparrow shop in it. Yeah, show, them the, show them which is the Mahoney's. And this is Mahoney's. <laughs> Still there. And at one point, that was Livingston's Pharmacy. And I don't know what this is, but eventually it ended up being what is now uh, uh, Megalby's and all of those building, brick building there, built in uh, uh, the 1930s. And then this was the Knowles Block and I believe a uh, Knowles family lived there way back in the 1800s. Uh, so this was the railroad track. And this is where the Church of the Holy Spirit held their first meetings. And they're 85 years young this Sunday, coming Sunday, and we held our first meetings uh, up there. Uh, and there was a donut shop down here, and they called it the donut, the Church of the Holy Donut. <laughs> Next one, please. This is the snow block. This was built by Stan's great-grandfather, Aaron Snow, who also built the middle section of the Orleans Inn uh, in 1875. This was built in 1884, and it was taken down board by board, brick by brick, brick by um, uh, Albion Bessie, Brian Bessie's father, in the 19, late 1930s, 1940s. Uh, this was a grand hall which had town meetings, dances, basketball games, roller skating. And they kept talking about skating. And I'm thinking, how did they do ice skating? I don't know. Roller skating. Uh, and these were apartments. And this was a shooting range and an, uh, and an arrow archery range. And underneath was uh, a... a uh, plate for wagons and horses. Oh my. Uh, so that was uh, the snow 